Okay, hi, welcome. Um, my name's Claire Jeffers. I work at the Art Gallery as the uh, program coordinator. Usually the director, uh, Ingrid Jenkner, would be here to uh, say a, a welcome, but she's ill today. Um, so uh, Julie Hollenbach, the curator of the exhibition that's on right now, Unpacking the Living Room, is um, going to add a few additional words to uh, what she was going to My say. existing words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I just, on behalf of the gallery, wanted to say welcome and thank you for coming and thank you very much to the speakers. And I'm sure it'll be a very dynamic um, discussion. Unfortunately, I can't stay because I have to go prepare the next stage of things. Um, but um, thanks uh, to everyone and to Julie. Thanks, Graham. Um, the next stage of things is a reception down in the gallery space, so when we're done here, we can move our conversations downstairs and sort of continue them um, with our uh, panelists, if they're able to stay and join us, and with each other. So, like, stick your hand up if you can't hear me. My name is Julie Hombach. Um, this roundtable is part of the programming that accompanies the exhibition I'm packing the living room. It's currently in the gallery, and some of the pictures that are going to cycle um, on this screen are from that installation. It's uh, an exhibition that is a collaboration involving 16 artists. It radically investigates and reimagines living rooms as spaces of social and cultural significance. Um, if you haven't visited the exhibition yet, we can do that afterwards. But for those who haven't been in the space to give you an idea, we built a living room um, inside the gallery space, and it acts as like a laboratory for play and experimentation. It hosts performances and workshops and grounds this um, discussion, this round table. The exhibition investigates domesticity and domestic spaces and practices and looks at it from different angles, multiple angles. Domesticity as a civilizing and assimilationist colonial process, um, residential schools in Canada for boarding schools for indigenous girls where they were taught to keep proper house, how to cook traditional European dishes, and the values, moral and ethical, of domestic and personal hygiene. Needlework and other domestic crafts were taught to girls as a way of cultivating a correct femininity, which was often also a white femininity. Prescribing binary genders, prescribing monogamy, prescribing heterosexuality, and prescribing the appropriate work uh, and behavior for indigenous girls and women, that being mainly housework and raising children, according to the Victorian model. The living room, as its stage, asks questions about the legacies of colonialism and racism in Western modernist decor. So modernism as an aesthetic movement mirrors colonialism as um, a way of colonizing people and places, but here colonizing culture. So this takes place through the appropriation of non-Western objects as simply pretty or aesthetic, forgetting that they are culturally significant, often tied to ritual and daily practice. In the living room is artwork that documents the impact of the displacement and dispossession of African Nova Scotians from Africville. Portraits of Africville residents standing in CU Memorial Park where their houses used to stand. This is work by Candace Baldwin. There's also on the table an aerial photograph of Africville from 1965, just as it's in the midst of the raising. Um, on the photograph, former president of the Africville Genealogy Society, Mr. Irvin Carvery, marked up and wrote in the names of landmarks and the family names of houses that are still standing. These portraits and the aerial map, along with an artwork by Nigma artist Charles Doucette, entitled Industry, and if it shows up here, it's on the mantelpiece. It's a concrete ceremonial pipe that is actually functional, and it looks like and is representative of the smokestacks of the generating plant in Tuscaro. Yeah. Um, these works speak to the impact of environmental racism and institutional racism on the communities of Africville and Turtle Grove. It's intentional that the living room exists in the institutional space of the fine art gallery. If museums and galleries are the public spaces charged with displaying the cultural objects of the nation, which 
affirms and prescribes state ideas and values as being universal and collective, like that everyone has them, then living rooms are the spaces where individuals arrange objects that affirm and express their identities. This collaborative exhibition invites guests visiting the living room space and to this round table and other events to consider what their living rooms say about them. What are their investments in that space? Is their living room a testament to their survival, to their resilience? What, how are we reflected in our domestic spaces? How do they confirm and ground us? I'm grateful that we can gather here to have this conversation on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, for me, considering and unpacking what it means to live according to the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1726, which still governs relations between visitors and guests to this land and the Mi'kmaq, Nasi, and Pasamakote people, is really important. That treaty did not surrender land, instead promised <coughs> to honor and respect indigenous ways of life and the connection between indigenous people and the land, plants and animals, life practices, ongoing. Thoughts of decolonization, decolonizing space are important to the exhibition. Many of the artists are responding directly to how ongoing system, systemic structures of colonialism and its resulting racism and white supremacy impact their lives and daily experiences. For many people, home becomes the important site of belonging and resilience and the powerful forging of resistance. This roundtable discussion with Lynn Jones and Dr. Sherry Pictuic, Gloria and Wesley, guided by L. Jones, addresses the legacy of colonialism and the impact of environmental racism historically on the communities of African Bone Turtle Grove, as well as discussing the ongoing effects of like, white colonialism and environmental and institutional racism in Chapukta, but also personally how that has impacted each of these speakers' different experiences. How these big systems affect the home, life, and culture of people today. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Al Jones, who will steer this conversation and guide a lot of the topics and move us around. Al is the NASA's chair in the Women's Studies Department here at Mount St. Vincent University. As many of you already know, she is a celebrated poet, activist, and educator. Al is a two-time national spoken word champion and Halifax's fifth poet laureate. Her poetry speaks powerfully to anti-black racism, institutional and environmental racism, poverty, histories of colonialism, and white supremacy. In 2014, Live from the African Re Resistance, a collection of her poetry was published by Roseway. Elle's important contributions as an activist and public intellectual include writing the weekly Saturday morning file in the Halifax Examiner and co-hosting CKDU's Black Power Hour. In 2016, Elle was awarded the Dr. Alan Burnley Rocky Jones Individual Award by the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission in recognition of her human rights advocacy. Before her appointment as the Nancy's Chair, Elle taught at many of the universities in town, as well as elsewhere in the province, including St. Mary's University, Dalhousie, NASCAD, and Acadia. In her creative activist advocacy and education work, Elle focuses on prison abolition, anti-racism and decolonization. And I want to thank Elle so much, as well as the Nancy's chair, for supporting this roundtable and Ennis Kirk um, for making this possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julie. <laughs> you just gave me a moment there because I just realized I forgot to put that on my resume that I just submitted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, that's a thing. I should have put it. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the map, welcome to this space. Um, I'm going to introduce the panelists in a moment. Um, I'm going to say a little bit first about kind of our journey through this exhibition. So last Friday, we came in together and we were able to walk through the exhibition and get some kind of impression. It wasn't the longest walkthrough, so I would say like a first impression that we were able to see of some of the exhibits. And then we had a bit of a discussion afterwards. I think at first, a lot of us were wondering how we would connect this idea of a panel that we were on about decolonization and then what the exhibit had to do with that. And so we had to talk through, I think there was um, some question about what was our presence here, what were we expected to do, what were we being called in to speak about. And so some of the things we talked about, um, some of which Julie covered in the introduction, 
Um, so we, we talked about um, our experiences in other people's homes. So historically, for example, black women as well as indigenous women um, were cleaning, uh, cleaning the homes of white people. Um, Robin Maynard, for example, in Policing Black Lives, talks about this is a form of surveillance on black women that often isn't talked about. So that black women spend time under the eye of white mistresses continually in the home, first under slavery, and then, of course, as maids, as cleaners, as domestics. And that this became this form of surveillance and behavior that 24-7 you had to be on your guard. Um, so that's an experience that we spoke about. Um, we spoke about gentrification and what that says to the experience at home. So um, this obviously connects to what we learned about, what we talked about in Africa in the introduction. Um, so when your home isn't stable because it's disappearing under the forces of gentrification or it's being raised or it's being, um, or you're being evicted from your house or you're being displaced. So these kind of histories of home that also exist. Um, we also talked about home in a different way. So what it means to be at home in the world as an indigenous or black woman. Um, for example, Lynn, Lynn raised a lot of questions around not just wanting to sit in front of a room and go, you know, it's so hard, like we were maids, we were oppressed. Um, and that that in itself also is a way of alienating, being alienated in these spaces. So um, claiming our own space within that and what that says about uh, being at home in the world as an indigenous or black woman. Uh, so we were talking about that. Um, what else did we talk about? We had another discussion. Well, we may as well just go right back off that door. <laughs> <laughs> so um, those are just some of the issues we raised. We'll get into them in more detail. But I raised that as the intro to say that we, we talked around this. So trying to think of, of where we fit in. And that discussion in itself was about exploring that idea of home. Um, also in this space, because um, obviously as either speakers, writers, academics, whatever our role is, um, that intervening role we're often called upon to play is also about space and place. Um, I think of Shereen Razik's uh, book, Race, Space, and the Law, so where she talks about how place and space are race. So she talks about the geography of cities and how settler geography, which imagines, for example, an empty Canada that we said settled by pioneers, is a practice of space that is also a practice of race, right? So whenever we think about space, we are thinking about a race and gender um, activity. So, I will, I will stop there since Lynn's suggesting I'm stealing her stories, but um, <laughs> here comes the baby. So to my right is Lynn Jones. I'm going to introduce, I didn't ask for bio, so I will just introduce people. Um, so Lynn Jones is a legend in the African Nova Scotian community. Her archive that uh, she's been keeping since she was eight years old can be seen in the Patrick Powell Library over at St. Mary's University, so I urge you to uh, go into that archive and and go through that collection. Um, so she's a curator. Uh, she was very active in the labor movement, the first black woman to be in an executive position in the ESAC union. Uh, she ran for office, um, obviously an active black womanist, um, and active in, in so many movements across the years. So really an activist since about age eight <laughs> um, until now. So Lynn is, is still a giant force in our movements. Um, she was recently uh, the coordinator for the community committee for the Justice for Janitors campaign, uh, which is related to this, for example, the cleaners, the practice of cleaning space. Uh, so that was a campaign against uh, black janitors that were being dismissed. They had had their contracts removed um, from a position cleaning a building downtown that raised these similar kind of questions about power and space and race. So uh, Lynn Jones is to my right, to my immediate left, Dr. Sherry Pink, and Dr. Lynn Jones as well, because Dr. Lynn Jones has a Honorary Doctorate from Acadia, so I'm not going to steal people's titles. Uh, Dr. Sherry Pictou, who's in the Women's Studies Department here at Mount St. Vincent University. Uh, Sherry and I came through Dalhousie at the same time and got hired at the Mount at the same time, so um, we're very connected. Uh, Sherry is a former chief of Bear River, uh, very active in the fishing movement. Um, she just spoke in my class on Monday, and, and the students said, my brain is so many things are happening in my brain. But she's so interestingly, and with so much stuff about treaty and food and different practices and canoe ways, and it was a really, really fascinating talk. Um, so she, her dissertation was on how women think about treaty, how how yeah. women understand treaty, um, and yeah, she's just an active public intellectual, a mother active in her community, and is somebody again that you know I have a great love and admiration for. And then to the far left is. Gloria Wesley, any doctors yet? 
Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, no, me either. <laughs> no attention of getting water and bringing it up. Well, no, they get given to you eventually. Uh, so Gloria, Gloria is a, a writer, um, but most recently the Chasing Freedom series, which deals with um, the lawyer settlement of Shelburne, and particularly um, black women's experience during that settlement, so the inventorship of um, the breach that black women had. You should read this trilogy. Uh, so you should read those books, they're excellent, so not only telling us the history, but um, amazing fiction as well. Uh, Gloria, I believe you also had the first book of poetry in African Nova Scotian published. 1977. 1977, the first book of poetry ever published by an African Nova Scotian. That is, I mean, yes, clapping, but also, uh, in a way, shocking that it took until 1977. Um, <laughs> I don't think that was that. Um, so really, somebody, a historic writer in this community, um, educator, uh, public speaker, public intellectual, and another just powerhouse woman. So it's real honor to be with you on the panel. Where I'm going to start, and I'll go this way, um, is maybe just if we can start with something brief about our first impressions of the exhibition. So that might be a very brief thing. It might be uh, something that stood out to you or just how you felt. Uh, experiencing the exhibition, so I thought we could maybe start there, and then Lynn, I see you have something prepared, so once we do that, maybe I'll see to you and you can read what you have, since I know you're, you're ready. But let's start with um, just on Friday when we saw that exhibition, was there anything that stood out, um, anything kind of feeling you had, anything that um, made you think about as you went to the exhibition? Well, um, actually, you know, what I'm going to do Friday, I'm going to do today because we were coming on the, up on the elevator, and one of the people in this room was coming up on the elevator with us, and um, wouldn't have known that uh, we uh, had already visited the exhibition, and um, just explained to the whole elevator, have you seen that exhibition? It's absolutely fabulous. It's so neat. And I thought um, afterwards, I said, yeah, it's really good. So I was thinking that when we first got to experience the, ex um, the exhibition of the art, it was the same response. And it's like um, something that you want to share with other people because it's not traditionally what one thinks about in terms of art and the living room to challenge you and your um, your thoughts about home. So that was my uh, my initial response both today and uh, when we first went to. How about you, Shannon? Well, mine wasn't uh, like that at first. I had to really search that living room before it dawned on me that these were very critical um, artists. And I thought, well, how? I had sort of a, a very uh, strange reaction, and I couldn't put two and two together. Why would we want like African Nova Scotian women and Indigenous women to comment on a living room? And uh, I just, I, I, I just couldn't put two and two together until we were actually there in that space, trying to figure out, you know, do we fit into that space? How do we relate to that space? And there was some storytelling that was very moving and moving at the beginning. And, and uh, it was only after certain objects were started to point out with me, and that was the pipe with the three smokestacks. And that I would see these um, older books, very stereotypical books. I can't remember, but like something along the genre of Toronto and Jamal. Uh, Geronimo and so forth in the corner, or that the fact that I was so comfortably sitting on the couch that I realized that there was uh, that there was an indigenous artist that put some bead work, like in terms of sayings of her family's uh, favorite sayings. So at first, at first glance, you really have to go to that exhibit and say, say, okay, there are some critical pieces here, and then I could start connecting to them. To, to those pieces, but, for, but initially I thought, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. And I'll explain a little bit more about that after. Mm -hmm. 
okay, my initial impression was that there's so much stuff here, like what am I going to connect to? And I started looking for things that related to myself personally and objects that expressed some connection to my childhood, to my home, my community, black community. And I lived uh, for over 32 years in an all-black community in Lincolnville, down in Geisler County. And um, I, I was hoping to see something that would draw my attention to how survival and living rooms in those communities would be represented. But um, I wasn't disappointed because it opened my mind to other things. Um, I will exhibit with all the hundreds of little gnomes. Um, I, I looked at that and I thought, now, how does that represent the living rooms? This space is so crowded with the same types of, uh, the same object, only painted differently. And it got me thinking about how we as communities and people like to represent ourselves as the same. And it took my mind to a whole different space, so it took me outside myself. I'm not sure that I understand it yet. But it, it raises your level of curiosity. I was familiar with the Africa photos. Um, I've been working with those now for two years. And so they were, that's still not my background as a black woman. So I didn't go up in Africa. I didn't experience the kinds of things that those folks experienced in their community. But then again, it, it, it draws you to imagining in your mind what it must have been like. So I think the exhibit really will be powerful in that it awakens us to other realities. When we were having the discussion afterwards, there was a couple of things that struck me, because my uh, family background is in Trinidad, which is, I mean, Canada's a colonized country as well, but Trinidad a colonized country in the, I don't even know how to distinguish, but in like the sense of being Trinidad. Um, so a lot of the stuff, like some of you guys are talking about, for example, um, the cold weather and having cells. Of course, that's not something that's part of the Trinidad experience. Um, don't get cold, it's in the tropics. But also, some of these practices actually were very Caribbean in the sense of having been inherited through uh, very British colonial practices. So my grandmother crochet. Uh, my mother does the whole lawn, table cloth, like full British uh, thing. The tea, which is often, I mean, also not of British culture, but also through colonial culture, with tea service, uh, is something that my grandmother also was very into. So she, in many ways, had a lot of these very, very, like, British practices. At the same time, was a woman in Belgian country living in poverty. Uh, one of the stories that my mother told is that, um, I don't know if you know who Eric Williams is, a uh, famous uh, colonial philosopher with first prime minister of Trinidad and Independence. And his family, back to my family, and his, um, I don't know if it was his mother or whatever, my grandmother uh, would clean the house, they'd be out like, so putting up the laundry at like 4 a.m. that they wouldn't look at each other because the pretense was that they had domestic. So they would you know, be out there sweeping the porch and like putting up the laundry, and they wouldn't greet each other. And then they would come out on the porch when they were finished with their teacup, and then they would say, you know, good morning, Mr. Good morning, Ms. Williams. Um, because it was this uh, like pretense and respectability, right? Um, while they were, of course, on their knees scrubbing the floor. So that's an example of home space that I remember telling. So, Lynn, I don't know. I'm going to jump to you. You have something prepared. So I don't know if you want to speak, and then maybe we can uh, move through that. Good job. Uh, since we do, before I do speak, um, some of you are at the back, and maybe can't see as well the display. So based on what I'm speaking, it's really important that you kind of stand up and look and make sure you can get an idea about what's on this table. So take one second and just make sure that uh, I don't even know if my other panelists know what's on this table. Just to make sure as I move through. Sorry, Sorry. Ah, I want to interact with this 
So this is about unpacking. Come on, Joy. Get ready for church or we're going to be late. The days of arriving as the Spirit moves us is gone. You know, folks, nowadays are more interested in what time you get there than what you bring in your heart once you get there. The difference between when it's time and what time it is. I know you don't understand now, but in time, you will. Any way you look at it, it's important to thank the Almighty for what he has done for us. In the old place in Africa, God wasn't he, but I guess inside your heart, he can be viewed any way you like. You know you'll be accused of being backwards if you dare mention he could possibly be she. Probably stupid, unethical, fat, religious. I've heard it all. I'm your grandma's faith. But it wasn't always so. The missionaries back in half Africa imposed their names upon everybody in my village. No one here in Canada even knows my real name. Heck, sometimes I forget myself. I rarely hear it, hear it anymore. But you remember it, don't you? It's Ogochuku. People here don't even try to pronounce it. Said it's too hard, so decided for their convenience, they call me Faith. I don't argue. Your name's Chenene. They call you Joy. Yet they call it developing a Canadian mosaic. Don't speak your language, don't wear your traditional clothes, don't bring your cultural values, and God forbid, don't expect to find comfort in their homes, especially in the living room. Huh, this living room's a mess, albeit a comforting mess. Look at all those papers on the dining room table. Not enough space in this house to set up a fancy office. No spare room here. I've been collecting articles on that table for over 50 years about African people all over Nova Scotia, across the country and around the world. If I didn't do it, who would? How would you and other people know about our black communities and our contributions to society? White people don't seem to care. We've got to look out for ourselves. I just can't understand why white folks think it's so important to have their living rooms empty. They call it neat and tidy. I call it a crying shame. Mm -hmm. A shame that all that space is going to use with no one using it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Joy, here's an article on the table about the waters flooding our homes in Truro. I've been trying to get those dikes and dams fixed forever. I don't think there is a, hardly a black and First Nation community in this province that isn't affected negatively by one element or the other. That's because they physically placed us on the outskirts of towns and cities with a little means to survive. Basically, they chose to forget about us. Probably thought we'd roll over and die. If it wasn't flooding, it was dumps, or it was poisons. Probably why so many in our communities are sick and afflicted. Most of the black community in Toronto is gone. No money to fix their homes. The developers have money, so they bought the land, and now the community looks pristine. Just the way they like it. <coughs> Gentrification and environmental racism. You need to learn all about that, Joy. Stop this madness. Can't do it alone, though. I joined up with the trade union movement a long time ago. They are not perfect, but at least they say, solidarity forever, not victory for one, but victory for all. They're supposed to protect all workers, but they have deep-rooted systemic discrimination. Yet, they even dared look at their own structures and create a report on the institutional racism rampant in their organization and in society in general. The Anti-Racism Task Force report I was there to hear the stories from all across the country. So sad. Stories of exclusion and complacency. The report says employment equity clauses should be developed in every collective agreement, 
and utilized when we want to let the last hired go when workplaces are downsized. Of course, that means us. We're last. We go first. First to get in the door, and then the door gets slammed in her face. Bet that book's not on the right, their dining room table. I wish every organization would do a report. We can only try to change things. Ah, ah, ah. So many memories in the living room. I remember scrubbing their floors while they ate in the lap of luxury. And what about us? The big pot-bellied stove that sat in the middle of the floor, leaving behind dirt and ash from the wooden coal. When the fire went out, it was cold. You then moved to the kitchen, where the whole family congregated to stay warm, do homework, eat the meal, play music, sing, pray. Oh, what a great time. I thought when I moved to Halifax, only one thing I'll know is I'll be successful if I can get a place where there's heat all over. My name is Hogo Chuku, not Faith. I come from Igbo land in Africa. I know nothing of this thing you call tribe. African people come from Africa. All people come from Africa, as Mother Africa birthed all of us. The black, red, yellow, and white people, we come from many lands. Evil land, Yoruba, Shona, so many. From shore to shore, we believe in one supreme God who is everywhere and watches over everything. Africa is the beginning, and we will fight to make it the end. In Africa, food is plentiful. Food in the trees, food in the ground, food in the water. Coconut, fish, fowl, fruit, and vegetables. We had the highest institutions of learning in the world. Many came to marvel at our wisdom. The Greeks regularly came to Timbuktu and Mali to learn our ways. The elders were our scholars and the land our teachers. We protected the waters and all living beings. We are the keepers of the waters. We had minerals, diamonds, gold, copper, uranium. We had medicine. Oh no, here they come. We didn't come as settlers. The white men came to take us away. They bought guns, their religion, the military to enslave us and steal our ways. They tied our hands and bound our feet. Our communal way is no match for their plundering and greed. Our bodies, minds, and souls were sold to the highest bidder. There's so much I could tell you, Jimene. Let us pour libation to our ancestors. Let us gather in our rooms the way we did. Let us seek the reparations that are due us for all that has been done. We will leave it to the youth of today. They're organizing. They're doing it. They know the difference. Come on, girl, let's get to church. So what, um, what brought you to, to write that amazing piece? I don't know how amazing it is, but uh, as I was thinking about uh, uh, the living room, I, it was actually quite easy to think about all that was taken away and go back and think about how it used to be or from whence we came. And um, I think it was Sherry who, who said, I, I was thinking at one event, uh, an event at one time, and somebody picked up on what I had said, it just came, because they were talking about the activism, for example, we could do activism around environmental racism. Um, uh, I remember the um, Confederate flag activism, the, the moving of the Canada Employment Center. <clears throat> All these things that often the organizing took place in the living room, in the front rooms. There was no special area. That's where it took place. But the saying became, because they asked, well, when did you start this activism? And it was, like you call it activism, you named it activism, I call it survival. 
and you do things to survive. So the home was a place of um, survival. So maybe that's why the exhibit um, wasn't difficult to make, for me anyway to make the connections to, um, you know, for a company of their own. Sharon, uh, there's a lot in what Lynn was saying that really tied in and resonated with what you were talking about on Monday in my class. So Lynn was speaking about some nutritional food practices, um, a lot of the things that we've lost. Um, and so I was thinking about your work on reclaiming, so what you, some of the stuff you were talking about on Monday was about you know, reclaiming your new, um, reclaiming fishing. And so I was wondering if any of that resonates with you or how you'd like to perhaps either respond to them or move forward from what you need to yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, Lynn could be late right away. Like I said, I had to find my um, way in that living room <laughs> and really think about it. And and um, but like Lynn said, immediately I thought of his procession: turtle, uh, turtle um, cove, or I call it house cove. Uh, a lot of his procession, and of course, uh, I'm always very cognizant of where uh, Mount St. Vincent is. And on one side of us, we have a 500-year-old petroglyph of the um, eight-point star of Enigma, and on the other side, we have a 200-year-old uh, Africville cut, and, and how uh, we're just dispossessed, how we've been uh, dispossessed. And, um, and so the living room for me, and unpacking the colonials in the living room, it was a safe place at times. But when you step out of that living room, it was a very unsafe place. And Gloria and I were talking earlier about uh, uh, how we were like violently, um, kids would throw rocks out, I was going to school and so forth. And, and so forth. And so, with what I was talking about in uh, ELF class is like on tree relations and, and how there's, um, how tree relations, like anything, is discussed up in formal circles up here, but how does that really translate down to the ground? And a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing is, is <coughs> restoring ancestral communities that run through private property, public property, and so forth, but some of our ancestral communities as a way to kind of regain our relational, what I call after a uh, take from John Burroughs, a um, legal scholar in the University of Victoria, is relational mobility. And so in, in so many ways, the living room was a safe place, but there was just so much work and still so much work going on when you leave the room, I guess. That makes sense. That's yeah. I was also going to say that as we talk about living rooms, one of the things that raises to me um, in this age of precarious labor is I don't, I mean, I have an apartment, but I don't have a living room in the same space. Like, I moved almost every year. I don't have a lot of furniture. I got rid of most of my furniture at one point, and I don't have stuff. And so as a related, you know, this new economy, where, especially in Halifax, where prices are way, way up due to gentrification, due to um, lack of all these things. So I think for a lot of us, for example, um, there's no potential for home at all. So we have this living and rented accommodation, and we don't have the same relationship to home and space anymore because of the economic Lori, I saw you taking a ton of notes there. And I didn't want you to, I don't want to press you into retelling a story that you told, but you had a very powerful story um, last time you spoke, and I was wanting to share that, but as well, I know that you did know. Well, the story I shared last week with the other panelists was about my growing up in Europe, and about a very wealthy woman there who, um, to whom I was placed for the summer as a, as a domestic. And I was 14 and I was about to go to high school and my parents couldn't afford to send me because at that time we had to buy everything in our textbooks um, the materials that we needed. So off I went on uh, 1st of July to this very gorgeous home. And uh, I made beds, I 
I mopped, I cleaned the bathroom, I cooked meals. And the lady instructed me um, rigorously. You know, she, everything had to be done to perfection. And when I think about the impact that that had on me, how I, when I make a bed, everything has to be smooth. And it annoys everyone in my home to that. You know, but um, the spaces that you grow up in reflect who you are. And they reflect your experiences. And for me, I think learning who I was, I, in that home, um, I grew up in a very multicultural community. And in them, there were um, white people, French, and English. Uh, there were Jewish people, black people, native people. And we all had our own little area in the community where we lived. And very rarely did we connect. So, but I did. I, I connected with everyone. Even to this day, when I go home, I get to know everybody. But that summer, I learned who I really was. It was, you know, a very enlightening experience to be asked to cook dinner, to set the table, and at noon to place yourself down at the table with the others thinking we're going to have a lovely dinner. And when the mister arrived and sat at the table, he looked at me and asked me what I was doing with sitting there. And of course I was going to have dinner. But no, he said, you don't eat here with that And so that was an awakening for me. And if you could have heard the conversations in, in my living room that evening, they weren't about anger. They were about accepting my grandmother telling me, you know, that's just something you have to put up with. Don't expect to eat at your table. Don't expect to be paid because that day, at the end of the day, I was given a these cakes and a can of bacon grease to take home for my wages. And that was just something people thought was normal. And so conversations in my home were of acceptance. But I would love to have been a little bird and being in the living room of those people that I worked for. I would love to have heard what they said about me sitting at the table. And I just want to round this off because I'm a talker. But I just want to say that you hear so much from us about how we were treated, you know, what our past is. We're getting our history out there. Every day it's about some black person or some native person on TV. But what do you think about it? We don't have panels with you on the panel. To represent your point of view. What do you think about racism? What what conversations are in your living room about black people, about native people? That's where I think living rooms are the most important part of the home. It's where attitudes are going to change when white people in their living rooms talk to their kids about how others are to be respected and appreciated. So, I have no idea what you think, like people that show up to listen to the panel. I assume that you are the people in the community that are interested in change, that are interested in talking about these issues. But there's thousands of homes in Halifax where I don't know what people think. And they don't come out publicly until you take down the statue or we complain about the name of a street, and then they come up against us. Well, what were they talking about before they came in their living rooms? And that's the piece that's always missing for me, which is why I write. I, I not only tell you about the black experience, but in my books I want to talk about what the white people's experiences are, because 
We didn't come here and live by ourselves. We're all connected. You are me, I am you. We work together. We, we marry each other. What do you think? And so until I hear that I'm invited to the living rooms where people talk about their real feelings, you know, I, I hear people on the internet saying, you know, I don't believe in, in um, um, I can see what I was thinking political correctness. I've heard the conversations around that in their living rooms. So many people, I know Donald Trump doesn't believe in political correctness, but does he talk about the Canadians and his living rooms? <laughs> But still, he has he has a mind that's full of things that we don't know about. Oh. But they come out. I mean, he shows us. He, but it's it's those other living rooms besides my own more feeling. I was also, you told me I could use a mic, and that is not the case. <laughs> I was also thinking about, um, I think, and as we talk about home, we tend to move into a kind of dialogue where home is a safe space, and then there's the outside of your home. But we know, particularly for women, non binary people, trans people, um, that all have an all been a case of home. So I'm thinking also here. Um, Obviously, the Me Too movement, but revealing, you know, as we try to have conversations about domestic assault, sexual assault that people suffer in their home, um, you know, missing girls that are missing from their home. So, I also did want to maybe introduce that that we have a very safe space of home, the space where we could go back, the space where we could recuperate, where we could survive, but then home isn't all of that, particularly for women. Um, home can also be a very dangerous space for families. So, um, I don't know if people wanted to speak on that. That's not necessarily in the home, but also within our communities, like how women in particular have to have a resilience and survival practice, um, not only to the outside world, but also um, for marriages, for um, the problems of raising children, for those kind of problems that come to women in the home. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think you've uh, laid it over. It's interesting because my mind was wondering as uh, you were talking about that, because in my home I have two, two, no, well, two homes. I have my the home in Squirrel, which is um, the home that I grew up in, and now I call it uh, my home cottage. And also my house, that seems quite interesting because I was um, in my home in Squirrel uh, this very week. And uh, I haven't had a chance, Al, even to share it with you as of yet. But a person, and I'll make it short, but a person came to the door. By the grace of God, I prefer to say, I answered the door through the window. Now, nothing ever happens in this community. When I answered the door, the person at the door said, Oh, I, I, uh, my car broke down. Can you let me in to make a phone call? And, uh, from oh, my bedroom window, I yell, uh, well, no, but I can make the call for you. Mm -hmm. So I proceeded uh, to make the call. They gave me the number. There's no answer. But before I said that, I said, well, where's this car? And he named the street that was far away from the community. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, why are you here looking for a car that's far away from the community? The first, uh, it's a man, a young guy, and the guy ended up saying, well, really, I want sex, but he didn't use that word. And proceeded to continue to say, I want in, like, you know, and one of the lines that becomes very clear was, when's the last time you had sex with a 20-year-old white guy, was one of the, uh, the lines. Not using that word, it was worse. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, it ended up with the police uh, service who responded very quickly. And well, what I found really in not interesting, it was it's sad, 
was that in this day and age, although they did very well at uh, trying to apprehend the person, find the, the guy, the person, there was absolutely no thought of what happens to a woman in that situation. How do you feel? What can we do? Can we bring somebody here to be here? You need to call anybody. Can we? None of that. So, nonetheless, I thought, as an activist, this is not over. <laughs> so, I've been working since then, and it only happened on Monday. I've been working with since then in what we've called gaps in their system that are. So it still brings into what you're saying is that that home was not a safe place. And all of a sudden, it's not a safe place. And not only is it not a safe place, who is responsible for making our home a safe place? Yes. Oh, wow. Wow, I cannot do this in five minutes, but... Um, going back to this discussion, I guess, and, and the sense of home, I guess, where the part of safe places is, 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 is mobility. And you're very right, it's not about owning something in one particular place and time. And one of the, you know, a lot of, uh, from this, from this display, uh, triggers Myself, and it really triggers the childhood memory for me. And one of the things that we don't know uh, is how Indigenous women have been so disrespected and dismissed from probably the time of uh, the arrival of the Yorkies. And how I was just thinking about it, Glenn was talking about how. If you marry an indigenous man from another community, you were forced to leave your community. Not much always, but not always uh, the case. It used to be sort of like by local if you married. And how you had to uproot yourself when you kept your from your home and leave the first home. If you marry a non-native, having to say you had to get out of the community altogether. This caused all kinds of problems, whereas if Native men marry a white woman, she gained status for the instance, right? And it's problematic. But I think, uh, when I think back to my childhood, it was the elders who kind of took care of us, but the, the downside of that was there was always a high degree of alcoholism. I can remember, I'm from Bear River, not the kind of community I can remember when I was in the street in that community. And, uh, and it took me a, a long time to understand that when people were drinking, it was the elders or the grandmothers who would take us and take us into a room and walk the door so nobody could get at us or, and, and so forth and protect us that way. And it took me a while to really understand why this rampant alcoholism came up to me. And now I, I know with my aunts, they were, they were in, um, and then we can hear stories in terms of how um, they were they, they were the women were domesticated in the sense that they were to be and this of the past of the women had a lot to do with the three were to be the good housewives while the men were to become uh, broke arms in one of the most in, in a truly uh, poor pieces of land for growing. And you hear these, you hear these um, stories growing up and how women with really behind the scenes have to be really strong because the dominant sort of patriarchy and the head of patriarchy that is the sort of argument is that it's been by immediate agents, the immediate man, white man, the Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the Indian Act came, it displaced uh, our traditional government systems with Indian, uh, or Indian, what do you want to call it, Indian, here in Canada, Indian Act, um, with uh, males. 
and the women were not allowed to even vote in our own elections, even in our own, for our own people until about 1951. Then, of course, we didn't have the right to vote for 1960. And I remember, uh, I often say, with the way this feminist, that we had these groups up in third ways, and we put an indigenous uh, woman's um, experience by them, they don't equate those ways. We didn't. They don't equate at all. Mm -hmm. And so, what, like, when I look back to community, what theory I'm saying, um, in, 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 sense, in the sense that uh, <coughs> we're doing it in so many ways, but in the sense that there, there's a lot of trying to shut doors and so forth. And I just have to finish off because I'm across it too with one story from uh, one of my grandmothers. And this was later, these were residential food survivors. There were men, one guy in fact, who fought for, you know, in World War II, but was not didn't have no voting rights, per se, or considered even a person under law. But they were all drinking, and, uh, this, and she really got mad. She had this taken care of a lot of children and so forth, and she wanted to claim her kitchen space, not so much living, but the kitchen space, space. And there was an old wood stove in there, and so she went and she put a bunch of black pepper on the top. The spot was the stove and drove those dogs out. <laughs> and that's resilience. That's the model. In African culture, sure, they call it a set on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. set yeah. on the neck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that point about the kitchen space is really important because I feel like you did have the kitchen. Our yeah. living room was a sort of public kind of space. So that's the tent. How many people came to, uh, to look at me pretending you were respectable and then went back to the kitchen? I think that's probably yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Gloria? Well, I think that we hear a lot of, about white women coming forward now with their accusations of sexual assault, uh, rape, sexual abuse. And it's a very singular narrative to me in my head because black women have been the victims of sexual abuse since we came here in slavery. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons I'm light skinned instead of dark skinned is that my mother was the child of a rape by a white man against her mother, who is a very dark, dark woman. And people say, that's your grandmother, and I say, yeah, we come, you know, like I'm 57, we got 57 chains in our family. My mother does not know who the father is. And so this narrative of sexual abuse reminds me that living in a black community, we, women in those communities are victims of their own men and men from outside the community. There was never a Friday night when the yards were full of vehicles driven by white men coming mm -hmm. with their booty mm -hmm. from black women. And the same with Native reserves. Very much. Mm -hmm. You know, Native people today do not resemble the original Native people. They've got blonde hair and blonde. So how did that happen? Black people now, though we've intermarried, but there was a time when we didn't intermarry, but there were a lot of white skinned black people. And so this singular narrative that I hear from the Me Too movement, sure there's a handful of black women that are doing the movement, but black women still have not opened up about the truth of what right. happened to them in their community. You know, we were raped, we were violated in so many ways, myself included. You know, the first time I was attacked by a white man in my house, I was seven years of age when he came into my bedroom to find him. And, you know, and then later it was an uncle when I was about ten. And this <coughs> continual violence in our homes, we, we, we don't talk about it. And maybe the Me Too movement with white men and usually not the average people, it's usually a woman of, of means, you know, a woman who already is 
door in her thoughts that she can speak. But there's so many others that are not secure in her thoughts that aren't speaking. So, you know, our living rooms are a place to stand all of these conversations. You can't pretend that they're just nice little new places that are covered in, 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 in little knickknacks and cushions and sofas. There's more that we need to do. I think that's a, a good statement to go because you're absolutely dead on. And um, this is when people sometimes don't understand what we're talking about when we talk about the intergenerational trauma that's taking place um, within our community. And this is the effect. We're today experiencing the effect of many generations of trauma and violation. Um, that can manifest itself in so many different ways. And uh, yet, we have the tendency to blame the victim rather than understand the historical um, roots of life. But I have to add something because we had a earlier discussion and we are talking about um, I don't, I was hoping not to have to bring that, but what's happening in the United States right now. And that's not too far to use of what's happening around this here in Canada and your pieces and about this uh, uh, the violence that's uh, perpetrated by white men and how that was perpetrated on us. And, and Gloria and I were both talking about how walking to public schools and having rocks and stuff thrown at us by white cops. There was other, you know, most of what but there was some white students that participated in that. And how that has still has an impact on us to this day. And quite frankly, you could probably talk a little bit a little bit, but uh, as I came off the environment, there was a big for my community interpretation of, uh, of what treatment was is to them. It, um, there was an aha moment with an elder who guided me in terms of is there a link to this perception and what is happening with the missing and murdered and missing women. And I find it so, when you look at these supreme institutions like supposedly the U.S. government, the U.S. Senate, and you look at the privileged um, schools, the, the, the dentistry, or the or the uh, athletes uh, SMU and so forth. I don't think as 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 I'm saying, I don't think for those of us who have um, survived intergenerational abuse realize what an impact psychologically that has on us. Uh -huh. And it really does. And I re I, you know, I, I I you know, not that I'm a young and but I remember even walking in the um, uh, Point Pleasant Park, and if somebody was coming up behind me, I would just almost freeze, and I would just, you know, and it was that old survival chapter, oh, I'm going to crisscross this way so the stripper doesn't fall on me. Or you think about when, when the blatant white supremacy, male supremacy, that still gets away with what is happening in today's society. It scares the living day like out of me. And because it's telling, you know, here we have really privileged women coming to the Me Too movement, and that's great, but basically what the institutions are telling me, and even our academic institutions, is that I'm still disposable. My body is still disposable. So, we triggered something there, Gloria, <laughs> and I, I just wanted to kind of share that because, um, you know, living rooms, you, you, you look at something that's owned, but I'm like, when I'm living in a red house on the red, so you have to be own a little tiny apartment, and I don't have a living room to say it's a workspace, mm -hmm. and I think that's what we all brought up, but uh, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about how women of color, indigenous women, bodies are still to be, to be, to be disposable. And 
I'm hoping that to some of our work that it's not my granddaughter that's sitting here three years from now and saying, oh, you know, my people are winning her and this is winning her and now it's two times the rate of the rest of the community. I'm just going to add, I think we have discussion is that we don't hold the perpetrators to a high standard. You know, we have I, I raised a boy. I raised my own in a foster home that I was in. And I do teach him about women, the value of women. Hopefully, through how they saw me and how I related to them, they can see that women are important in their lives, that we perform certain roles to ensure that males are secure and that they have a good future. But we don't, I didn't actually teach that. I didn't actually talk about it. So my son down in this meeting, he was home a few weeks ago, and his boss came home, and I asked him, he said, is there something I should have told you growing up about women? And he said, other than that you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Because he hasn't had a really good relationship with this particular woman. But I said, okay, I accept that about this one, but what about all the rest? Well, what is your view about women? And I think he sees women as merely homemakers. Even though I worked outside the home. And it kind of it kind of reminded me to talk more to him about women. And I wonder, in our living room, did we talk about the value of women to our young men or to our husbands? We might complain that they don't do the dishes. But I think a lot of white men today are feeling lost because women have come to the forefront to talk about their issues, their role, what they expect what they want, how men should be behaving towards us. But they're from a world of masculinity that we haven't really challenged. And this this idea that men should go to parties and break each other and falling on their heads. And then women do it too because that's the modern you know, we weren't allowed in taverns or or burns. So now when we go, we act like vengeance, we get <coughs> unconsciously drunk. And so I think there's so much in this living room that, you know, we haven't talked about. And I didn't see it in the exhibit either. I didn't see things that are important to our daily lives that we need to get on. I did see other, you know, the past. What was the past like? Really to East Pike, Africa, you know, the community. But in this living room, we need to talk to our men as well as to, as women talking to each other. We need to talk to our little boys. We do the boy who is men. You know, what are we going to tell him about his goal who is men? You know, is it okay to drive down to the reservation and pick up the woman? Is it okay to drive to uh, Lincoln down and pick up a black woman for the night and get drunk, sit in their house and get drunk and then, you know, take advantage of her because they're still doing it. You know, the, the bar can still go and pick up women and take them and murder them later in the evening. If when are we going to open up the conversation with men? We're doing a good job keeping them amongst their sides of women. But when are we going to bring them into the conversation? We have to think about men how do we see them as a baby who can try to take the team and go home 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 and go home. And that was her advice. Yeah. And that was the advice. So he runs around and he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to my, that was the, you know, he gave me the ring. So that's what he put up with. So that's that's the generational 
kind of trauma. But I do want to, and by the way, my grandfather has a story of him knocking on my grandmother's door. Uh, literally in Patrickness, and she has to put up the phone. Well, my mother, I just want to add this, my mother-in-law, uh, my father-in-law has two women. Okay. And it's perfectly acceptable yeah. to, to my mother-in-law that he has another one down the road that he takes, drives it past the house with her. I got his in total shock. Like, how do you accept that as women? Like, how, you know, are we going to be monogamous or are we not? I just want to be kind of off because I just want to leave a couple of minutes for questions. It's 4 26. Uh, we started a little late, so maybe 10 minutes and then we'll wrap up. Well, I just want to make a comment to what you said. Of course, the uh, maternal police officer who was picked up and later killed in the north end, that was like that was a block over from where I lived in the north end. Now, when I go by, I mean, literally, it's like this. Instead of a spot on the sidewalk, I see my building and see the, uh, the house that was passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Almost every case you hear the woman was so drunk she can't remember. Like how many times are we going to hear that? That that I can't really tell the police what happened because I was so drunk. And still we don't challenge that myth that it's okay to be drunk. Not just for women, but men too. Like two drunk people are having sex is not something I visualize in my head. <laughs> something good, you know, yeah. and yet it's every, every day around us.
we think like oh, our living room is probably like, it's mostly just mirrors so because it's not secure, it's not perceptive, and have our space to feel. And it's almost like a security, like encompassing ourselves with all the things that we already know, but the idea of tying in some windows so that other people feel you know, this is just this is Any final comments? Now, it's just a comment on this. Um, if you come into my living room, <clears throat> in my living room, and it's not a new phenomenon, I'm really happy that things have changed over time, but I'm, I'm also cognizant of the fact that my living room has always been collected African people in that living room, and even in a time when it was not politically correct. So I've gone through the stage of being different, and then um, now we have more people have incorporated those types of living rooms. And I do that intentionally, because both sides of that living room, it's cool, it's hostile, it's racist, it's all those things, thank you, give me some more words, violence. And there is little opportunity for a person of color to feel safe in surround with who they are, what they are, and to build their confidence, to build um, all of them, all of the things that makes us able to operate when we leave that living room. And you're right, people sometimes come in that living room and they'll talk about um, and this is another discussion we'll talk about when your living room is racist because you don't enclose everybody else in this, oh <laughs> in this, uh, this uh, you're really racist. But then we can get into a whole discussion about how racism manifests itself and what, what, it, what it is. So I think we need to also be really careful about how, how people develop um, themselves and who they are and what they represent in those states uh, that are places. Ah, the whole concept of living in the diversity of the living room. All the things we could talk about that don't have to ask. But I, again, I guess it's very mobility for me. Um, and I don't know what it is inside me. I don't know if it's being brought up on the reservation or what it, what it, what it is. I know when I travel from, or have traveled from India or Africa and so forth, and you have to make the connection either in France or London to do that final trip overseas. And I'm always conscious of how it's very multicultural until I get on that plane from London over, and all of a sudden it becomes one color. And I've been for being white, but I know I'm even as a different shade than most of the people on that plane. And I get ridiculed a lot, particularly where I talk a lot about food sovereignty and why would you want to be shopping at Walmart and so forth, but it's West End Walmart. And I love it. I absolutely, and I go there because I feel at home and because it's so multi. Cultural. Yeah, there's all kinds of shades, and I go there to pick myself up. So if I can't get home for a couple of weeks, and it's just something, and this is what I love about the mouse, there's just something of being in a multicultural setting where I'm at peace. And I, and that's the only time that I know that that low level anxiety that I have in other spaces goes away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love the spaces. They make me realize that I'm part of something bigger than my little community, bigger than Halifax, bigger than Canada. They just open me up to the world. And if I had money, I'm sure I would never be in Halifax. I would just, just be non stop going up and all moving around. So much beauty and artistry. And um, I think at the Mount a couple of years ago, we had uh, class around the world. 
We've also ended, we didn't pick this up, but Lynn has really demonstrated that. Um, that I think that we have the best. So it's fast and fast and fast. All the women that we didn't get to that are inside here. Um, we also obviously didn't get a chance to first talk much more about the of migration and the university of migration. Um, certainly my local prison is home in the place we want to get to. So this concept intersects in a lot of places. So as we go into these visits, and I'm like so hungry, so I'm like, let's get to this. As we, as we go to this exhibit, those are some of the concepts we can carry with us to visit it, you know, to revisit it through that way, or to get a chance to do it through the So thank you to all the panelists, to Gloria, to Sherry, to Liz. Um, thank you to the art gallery, uh, Julie, for um, curating and creating this exhibit. Um, I know Ingrid's not here, but uh, Odysseus, <laughs> all the, the staff from the art gallery to the mouth, and to all of you for coming, and thank you very much. Thank you.